Hey everyone, welcome to Singularity Computers Client Build 17 Part 2. In this video, I'm going to complete the system and do the testing. So this is the final part of the build log. Before the system is complete, I still need to complete the water cooling loop and fill it, install the custom wiring and do the cable management and install the lighting. The Titan X has now arrived. I mentioned in the last video that the client has decided to upgrade from the GTX 980. This is an Asus Titan X. So NVIDIA has still used the same stock cooler, but it's now in black, which I do think is an improvement. But stock coolers don't really bother me because all I do is remove them anyway. So I have here the EK backplate and water block for the Titan X. And this is the CSQ clean nickel plexi version of the water block. Now something that EK has changed in their graphics card water block designs recently, they've added a jet plate design like what you see on a CPU water block. So you can see that here. And graphics card water blocks have always been fairly simplistic in their design. So this is possibly going to mean a performance improvement. I now need to start on the tubing because before I can install the graphics card, I need to install the length of tube on this side of the build. The tubing I'm using in this build is Bits Power 16 millimeter acrylic and I'm using that right through the water cooling loop. And I'm not using fittings for the bends in this build. I'm going to be bending the acrylic tube. So you can see here I've installed the first length of tube and it goes from the pump up to the inlet on the CPU and motherboard water block. The water cooling loop is now complete. Now the way I like to bend acrylic tube is completely by hand. All I use is a heat gun and the silicon insert and I do things this way because it gives me a lot more freedom. It allows me to do things like the offset that you can see on the tube going back to the top of the res. And I can really do anything I want to with my bends. I just prefer doing it this way. But the problem is it means there's a lot of, of guesswork and estimation involved. So often what I end up doing, you can actually if you make a mistake on a tube, go back, straighten it out, and then bend it again, but the tube starts to lose shape. And you know, if you do it a couple of times, it really doesn't look that great anymore. So usually what I do is a, a prototype tube to try to get the bends right. And once I've figured it all out, I go back and redo it for a, a final time. So it does use a lot of extra tube, but in the end, it just gets me a far better result. And you know, getting the angles absolutely perfect when you're bending your tube is just so important. You can see it from a mile away when those angles are incorrect. And things like the two lengths of tube at the bottom there, where they're both the same height, getting those distances perfect, all of that, you know, sometimes using a bit of extra tube is definitely worth it. So you can see I've started filling the loop and I've just switched on the pump for the first time. And something I find with DDC pumps is, you know, when you switch on the pump, how quickly the coolant flows. Not so much with D5 pumps. I'm not sure if it's just due to the amount of air that ends up in the pump. I think they're a little bit more prone to getting air in them just due to the design of the pump tops. But the DDC is certainly a powerful little pump. As you can see from filling my loops over the years, it's always with the DDC that things move a lot more quickly. The coolant I'm using is Mayhem's X1 UV Red. Initially I was thinking of using Mayhem's Pastel Red, but it wouldn't have suited the Star Wars Sith theme as well as this color. And this coolant also matches up nicely with the art on the case, the candy red. It currently looks a little bit orange or a light red, and that's because of the amount of light I'm shining onto the build, and also because the loop is currently still full of air. And there's actually a big reason the loop is still full of air at this point, the air should be starting to, to exit the loop by now. That is because I forgot a major component. And that is the Bits Power Aquapipe, which is a tube that brings the coolant coming back into the res below the level of the coolant in the res. So the reason for this component is to stop air from going back into the loop and also to stop noise because it's very loud if you constantly have coolant, you know, trickling back into the res. You can overfill your res to partially prevent this problem, but then you're still going to have a little bit of an air problem. You know, the tiny bit of air that is in the top of the res 
eventually you can get rid of it all but you know it really would take a lot of time and the aqua pipe is just a, a great component it means the air comes out faster if anything it's now time to install the custom wiring so I've completed the leak test and now for the final phase of the build so all of the custom wiring is complete at this point and you can see that on some of the cables, the cables for the core components, actually the 24 pin and the PCI 6 pin and 8 pin, we've used some red sleeving. So the sleeving that I always use in my builds is MDPCX. So I've used a black and a red and just a couple of streaks in there to add a little bit more detail to the build. All of the cables are now installed and I've completed the cable management. So the system is actually ready to boot, but there's one final addition and that is the lighting. And the lighting I use in all of my builds now is dark side. The reason I use dark side lighting is because of the incredible quality, how bright it is, the colors. The UV lighting is the best I've ever used. It creates an awesome UV reaction and I'll put a link in the video description to where you can pick up this lighting. So the system is complete and in a few minutes I'm going to boot it for the first time. You'll notice I've used a lot of different cable management components around the build. On the 24 pin and 8 pin EPS cables I've used E22 cable combs, the smaller black ones. The rest of the cable management components you see are from ModSmart. Now I have a large collection of different cable management components and it means that when I'm building my systems I have cable management components that apply to every cable and every build so it really makes cable management a lot easier and as you can see from a lot of my builds clean cables are just about everything they really take a build to the next level so I highly recommend having a good collection mainly if you're building a lot of systems it's you know something that's not that costly and a great thing to have. So I'll put a link in the video description to where you can pick up all of these different cable management components. You'll notice that the fittings down near the drain port are on an angle and there was nothing I could do about this. It was just due to the way the radiator is manufactured. The outlet is on a slight angle and I come across this a fair bit where the inlets and outlets are not perfectly straight. The only way you can deal with this is by using the correct fittings to straighten things up. As I always do, I've run the lighting from the motherboard and I've actually run it from an optional extra PCB which comes with this motherboard which gives you an extra two four pin PWM fan headers. And the reason I use this because there was actually extra fan headers available is because it gave me two fan headers in a perfect position for the lighting. It meant less cable mess, shorter runs with the cables, and this is one of the biggest reasons I always run my lighting from fan headers on the motherboard. Also because there almost always is free fan headers, and it also gives you some form of control over the brightness of the lighting through fan profiles in the BIOS. Now something I always find with small form factor builds is that the cable management is difficult. And the reason for this is the terrible pinouts on most power supplies. And I wish that power supply manufacturers would fix this. I don't see why the wires need to cross over. For people who don't know, the pinout means the way the wires are organized you know, when they come out of the connector. And when they go from one connector to the other, you'd think that they'd go to the same position on both connectors, but they almost never do. They cross over. And not just one wire, just about all of the wires cross over. So it means an absolute mess, particularly on the 24 pin cable. And so the only way you can hide this is by pushing all of the crossovers down to the end where the cable isn't visible. And you'll notice I've done this on the 24 pin cable in this build. And what really helps is components like E22 cable combs. Now this system ended up getting another major upgrade. Originally I was going to use the Crucial M600 512 gig M.2 SSD. But I overlooked the fact that it's not even compatible with this motherboard. When purchasing an M.2 SSD, there's a few things to consider. 
First of all, there's a couple of different types, one which runs from SATA and one which runs off PCIe, and there's also a few different lengths. This motherboard is only compatible with PCIe M.2 SSDs, and the Crucial M600 is a SATA M.2 SSD. So I upgraded the client to the Samsung SM951 512GB PCIe M.2 SSD. And this is an incredible little component, and it really takes this build to another level. I mean, also considering the Titan X, this is an extremely high-end little system, certainly for an MITx build. Because just to briefly cover the performance results, the read is 2150 megabytes per second, and the write is 1500 megabytes per second. Certainly a component I'd like to have in my own build. Now I mentioned in the last part of the build log that due to the way we did the art on this case, it's very subtle and only appears from certain angles and in certain light. Now this is a really good example of that. You can see that as I'm walking around the case, the Sith Lord is hardly visible and then suddenly pops out as I start to look at it from more of a straight on angle. And that is pretty much in normal light. You could see that it was, you know, there's not a whole lot of light shining on that side of the case. I've included a whole lot of photos at the end of this video, and you'll see some more examples of how subtle the art is in these photos. You know, sometimes it's really obvious, and other times it's hardly visible, depending on the angle and the light. So the system is up and running, and now you can see what I've done with the lighting. Now, normally, having used red coolant, I wouldn't use red lighting. I'd probably use white lighting, but certainly not red, because it's not a good idea to flood a build with the same colored light as your coolant, it just takes from the color of the coolant. And, you know, the coolant color is something that you really want to stand out to show off the loop, but when you have the same colored light all around it, it just kind of fades it out a little bit too much, and, you know, it's not something I'd normally do, but due to the theme of this build being a Star Wars Sith themed build, red lighting was the only way to go. And for this theme, I definitely think that it does work. I'm now going to cover the test results and I'm going to start with the temperature results. For all of my temperature testing I mathematically adjust my ambient temperature to 20 degrees Celsius. All of my results are in degrees Celsius and are an average of the cores. For the idle test I cold boot the system and let it idle for 30 minutes. For the load test I run the 8064 stability test for 30 minutes. Now the client requested an extreme overclock for this system. So what that means for a client build is I find the limits of the components, but then I back off the overclocks substantially to be safe. I was expecting some amazing results from this system for a whole bunch of different reasons, but particularly from the CPU and motherboard because of this water block and also the motherboard itself. And I was very happy with the results. I managed to get 4.6 gigahertz, 1.2 volts on the CPU and for the core voltage that is 0.1 of a volt lower than the CPU runs at stock settings, which goes to show that you can easily run a lot of components at lower voltages than they're set up by default, mainly CPUs, and this is something that you can do in a system where you're not going to be overclocking, where you want it to run really cool and quiet, you can drop back the voltages, and often you can drop them back substantially without a problem. And I actually did test that for this CPU. It runs at 1.1 volts at stock settings. And I actually took it up to 4.7 gigahertz. And at that point, the, vo the voltage that was needed really started to jump up. So that's where I stopped pushing. The memory I took to its XMP profile of 1866 megahertz C9, 1.5 volts. And for the graphics card, I took it to 100 megahertz over on both the core and the memory and the power limit to its maximum. Starting with the CPU, at stock clocks at idle, 32 degrees. Overclocked at idle, 33 degrees. Stock clocks at load, 63 degrees. Overclocked at load, 74 degrees. The GPU, stock clocks at idle, 25 degrees. Overclocked at idle, 26 degrees. Stock clocks at load, 32 degrees. Overclocked at load, 39 degrees. Now, the motherboard at idle generally sat around 25 degrees. The hottest I saw it get was 35 degrees, which is excellent for an ITX board where normally the heat permeates from the CPU and MOSFETs, 
and heats up everything on the board. But due to the design of this water block being a full cover block, it doesn't happen. So the results from this water block are just excellent. So as you could see, some great performance results, particularly the Titan X and the Samsung SM951 make this an extremely powerful little build. And for those of you who wanted to know, the Samsung SM951 is not actually the NVMe version. So that sums up this build lock. Now, Client Build 18 has more modding than you've ever seen me do. And it shows off the new workshop, the new tools. You're going to see the new tools in action. And also some of our custom built components. And I have a surprise coming up very soon. I know I've made a lot of promises and I have gone past some of the dates that I've mentioned and I do apologize for that but what I'm doing behind the scenes currently is you know something that you don't often see and not many people are able to achieve and you know very soon you're going to start seeing what I've been talking about and I know that all of you are going to really enjoy it. That sums up this build log. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and favorite if you want to see more.